It is to be with you this morning. I want to take a moment just to honor your pastors, Pastors Jada and Conway Edwards. Thank you so much for having me in this weekend. There's literally hundreds of people that they could have on this stage, and, and I don't take it lightly to, to be with you this morning. I come from a very long way. I came all the way from McKinney. So glad to... <laughs> So glad they offered a car service. I said, that's unnecessary. I, I, can, I can drive myself. Took me about a minute and 45 seconds to get here. And so uh, what, a, what an opportunity I think we have to talk about a, a relationship that you and I have that can be very, very difficult. And that is a parenting relationship. Uh, I get an opportunity to uh, do a, quite a bit of speaking in corporate America. Uh, I actually grew up in a pastor's home, but I had a mind for business, and I didn't really know what to do with that, so I went to a Bible school and got a business degree, and so I'm now what some people would call a pastorpreneur, so throughout the week, I get to spend time with professional sports teams, Fortune 500 companies, speaking all around the world, and then on weekends, I get to uh, deliver God's Word, and I consider it a privilege to be able to, to do both. Now, what's interesting is, is uh, in our executive coaching practice, we get to sit across from some people that are pretty successful. Uh, the world has equipped them with the tools that they need to build a brand or to build a business. However, when I ask them how they're doing with their family, their countenance changes. It's as if the world is giving them everything that they need to build their business, but not everything that they need to build a family. They have figured out ways to connect with people all around the world through technology but they struggle to connect with their teenager that sits across the table from them. And so today I would love for us to continue this discussion on what it means to be a counterculture parent. I love what Pastor Conway said last week. His second point was it is easier to build strong kids than to repair broken adults. And so I believe that there is an assignment that you and I have, especially understanding this math. Did you know that if you are a parent, you only get 19 total years with your children? 18 of those years are in your house, but on average, when they go on to college, get married, and start their own families, what begins to happen is you begin to see them about twice a year. And so that last year is, covers the entire rest of their life. So you get 19 years. So you and I ought to be very, very intentional with the time that we have with our kids, whether we have young ones or whether we have adult children. Today's message is not just for parents. Today's message is for every parent, single parent, step parent, aunt, uncle, nanny, coach, teacher, anyone that has ever felt the weight of equipping a child for life. You might say, but Ryan, I'm not their mom, I'm not their dad, I'm just their coach, I'm just their teacher. No, you're not just their teacher. You might be the only voice of faith in their life. Like if it's at their gym, if it's at the classroom, if it's in your neighborhood, I don't know if it's at your job, you might be a mentor, you might be a mentee, you might be all they got, so be all they got. There is somebody in your life that has a destination to get to that may not get there unless you speak up and unless you speak life into them. And so today's message is for that. When I begin to really think about what God has called us to do as parents, I think about this verse in 1 Chronicles 29 verse 1. It says, then King David said to the whole assembly, my son Solomon. The one whom God has chosen, what I want you to know first and foremost is that God has a calling on every single child. Chosen. Just from the get-go, get that in your head, get that in your soul. God has a calling on their life. He says, the one whom God has chosen is young and inexperienced. And then I just love this next line, it says, the task is great. The task is is great because this palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. He is about to give his son a task of building a temple for the Lord God Almighty. And I love what David does. He goes, listen, I realize that he could think that this is a man-made assignment, but this is a God assignment. Each and every person under the sound of my voice might have a job, but did you know you also have a God assignment? And so do your kids. And I believe it is our job to help them accomplish their God assignment. But the task is great. Verse 2 says, with all my resources I have provided for the temple of my God. 
So I want to partner with God to be able to see in my son, see something accomplished. But the task is great. Today's message is entitled, Parenting Be Hard. Okay? Parenting Be Hard. Uh, When I think about what God has called us to do as parents, first thing that comes to mind is my parents. Um, I have the wonderful honor and privilege of having my mother on the front row right now. We honor you, Cheryl Lee. She calls one community church her home. And uh, I, this is a picture, uh, a picture of, of my parents. This is Emmanuel. He, he passed about six, six years ago. And, but when I think about my parents, I think about they prioritize prayer and they prioritize staying in God's word in every season. This is another picture of how we used to roll to church. Uh, we didn't play games. Um, <laughs> this whole sweatpants to church thing bothers me in my soul. Um, just because, you know, I'd spend an hour getting ready just to, just to get in the door. So uh, when, I, when I think about what God's called us to do as parents, I think about my own family. This is a picture of, of my family. This is my wife, uh, Amanda, our son, uh, Jackson, and Roman. Uh, if you don't know me and my wife's story, uh, my wife, when we were dating, I overheard her tell a friend that she thought it would be cool to get engaged and married on the same day. I had absolutely no idea what that meant, so I guess and began planning our wedding behind her back over the course of two years. And so on June 7, 2013, I got down on one knee. I said, Amanda, will you marry me? She said, yes. I said, just kidding. Will you marry me today? We opened up a lounge room door, and 85 of our family and friends were standing in there with a sign that said, today. We rolled in a dress, hairstylist, makeup artist, everything that you would need to get engaged and married on the same day. We were engaged for a real long time, solid 11 hours. And I'll uh, put it up on YouTube. It's called The Surprise Wedding. You can go home and, and watch that later. And then about eight months into our marriage, we had to actually figure out how to be married. I knew how to get married. I didn't know how to be married. There's levels to this thing. And so when we get married, and then one day, uh, I'm, I'm beginning to learn my wife's uh, vocal tones of when she calls my name and what those different callings mean. You know what I'm saying? And so I heard, Ryan. I went, ooh, that sounds like I'm in trouble. Okay, like what, what happened? And, and so I, I go into the bathroom, and she shows me uh, this pregnancy test, and she goes, I'm pregnant. And I don't know why I responded this way, but I, was, I guess I was in a real spiritual mood. And so I, I grab her, and I hold her, and I just said, Lord. I cannot believe you've chosen us for this time. And so we don't think we're ready, but apparently you do. And so, Lord, would you give us everything that we need to raise this child the way you would want us to raise this child? I felt very proud in that moment until we had our second child, okay? (laughs) Because the second child was a much different situation. I was taking a shower. She just slipped a pregnancy test in there. She goes, look what you did. I said, wait, 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 what's this? What's this? What's this? I said, how did this happen? She goes, you know how this happened. I go, who, who did this? She goes, you did this. I said, when? She goes, I don't remember. I said, uh, congratulations. She goes, congratulations. Are you going somewhere? I went, no, I just don't know what's going on. Talk, caught me off guard. <laughs> so, uh, so our youngest is Roman. This is a picture of Roman. Uh, he, he looks just like me. He's, he's my twin. We all wear we glasses and stuff. Um, <laughs> he's friendly, sleeps through the night. Uh, super chill, pretty much like me. And so uh, that, that's Roman. Uh, the second picture is of our oldest, Jackson. He, he's our little basketball superstar, loves to travel with his dad, has his own frequent flyer number, walks through TSA pre-check like he is somebody. Like, oh my gosh, is this your first trip? He's like, nah. And he just keep it moving. Like, he, he know what's good at DFW. Um, now, as we continue to parent our children, we just start to realize, like, parenting be hard. Like, I love my children with all of my heart. I really do. But I don't like my kids. Now, let me tell you why I don't like my kids. It's not that I don't like them. It's not something that they did. It's the ecosystem that surrounds them that I don't like, okay? Okay. And specifically, I am consistently comparing my upbringing in East St. Louis, the second most dangerous city in America, to their upbringing in North Dallas, and I just don't think it's fair, okay? (laughs) It's hard to parent somebody you jealous of, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) I just don't like it. It bothers me in my soul. 
I don't like my kids. I don't like my kids because they get to go to children's ministry. We didn't even have a children's ministry. You sit your butt on that front row and you will get pinched if you're not paying attention to a 90-minute message on Leviticus, okay? And so you're like, what? I don't like my kids. I don't like my kids because they get their day in court. They get witnesses, a judge, defense attorney. We get to talk about it, look at the evidence, and then decide the discipline. Us, you could get woke up out of your sleep, get whooped first, ask questions later. And then the investigation happens and they find out you ain't even do nothing. Oh, my bad. As I'm limping to school. What? I don't like my kids. I don't like my kids because they get to go to the doctor. Am I talking to anybody today? My kids get to go to the emergency room. I had never even been to an emergency room until they were born. I said, what is this place? This is nice. All you got is a little stomach ache. This is a $1,500 stomach ache you got. You know what we had? Drink some Sprite and lie down. That's what you need to do. If it's a holiday, you might get upgraded to ginger ale. Only if we got a little bit left over after everybody done had theirs. Don't mess around with me. Maybe some Robitussin if it's like serious, okay? <laughs> Snap my MCL, drink some Sprite, and lie down. I don't like my kids because sometimes they write, and it's embarrassing. I keep my car pretty clean, pristine, don't mess with me. Armor all, keep the leather looking nice. My kids don't care. Crunching French fries. Hey, 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 you want to do all that? Okay, we're going to wait till we get to the house to eat. Okay, but daddy, I'm hungry. I don't care. Starve. Okay, you're not going to mess up my car. <laughs> One day, uh, I just cleaned the car out. My son with a little dusty Crocs decided to go from the back seat, walk over the middle council, then walk on my seat to get out the car, which is strike one. Hey, son, maybe you didn't know, but now you know. <laughs> you don't do this. Do you understand? Yeah, dad, my bad. All right. Next day. He does the same thing. Okay, son, I don't think you heard me yesterday. I might have to put my hands on you now. I didn't want to do this, but now, now you have crossed the line of respect. This is my car. This is not your mama's car. I don't know what the rules are over there, but the rules here, you go out your door. I go out my door. That's how it works. I don't need your dusty crock prints all over my leather seats. All of a sudden, third strike. I said, son, third strike, you out. I snapped, lost my mind. He in the back seat crying. I said, what do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> this is what he said. The child lock is on. <laughs> hey, man, quit playing, man. You know I was just playing with you, man. Come on, man. Who put that child lock on? Your mama took my car, huh? That's what happened. It's her fault. Come on over here, man. Let's go get some ice cream. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Parenting be hard. Oh, it be, it be so hard. I just, I wake up every day and say, Lord, will you just help me today with these kids? I, you know what's interesting? Is there so many days where I wake up and I feel like I'm failing as a parent? And then I realize I have yet to meet a parent that said the following. I'm killing it right now as a parent, man. Let me just say, <laughs> I got a course coming out on Monday. Like, nobody says that. It's like, are we all that bad? Or perhaps there is a cultural expectation that is such a tall order that none of us are actually meeting. Because I believe that we have a cultural expectation to raise children that are always happy, good luck, cute. I mean, for the Photoshop filtered photo you got for that first day of school, maybe, but they don't look like that all the time, okay? <laughs> Clean. <laughs> that, whatever you did to help them hose them down will last a solid 10 minutes and then they fart. But now you're done. Bad parents, see? <laughs> Smart. You ever felt like, their grades or your grades. All right, I'm graduated. You, did, you got this grade. This is on you, buddy. Talented. 
successful Christian, we got a lot of pressure. Today, my hope and prayer is that we would take some of that pressure off. Um, this is a picture I want to show you. This is from Easter. This was us attempting to take an Easter photo. I love getting people's, you know, Christmas family photos. It's the biggest lie we've ever told. We make people believe that that's how our life is all the time. It's the exact opposite of what our life is all the time. I'm not supposed to show you this, but chaos is often what is our home. We're rarely matching, smiling in front of cameras. And so what I, the reason I want to show this picture today is because I want to alleviate a little bit of pressure that perhaps we all feel trying to equip the next generation. What I want to share with you today is not from a parenting expert. It's simply what I thought about parenting before I had children and what God is teaching me right now, now that I have an eight and four-year-old. Uh, before I had children, I used to believe that parents should take full responsibility for their children's upbringing. Uh, what I'm learning is that parents should partner with God and the local church for their children's upbringing. Because there is this sense of that it's all on us. It's not. Um, and in fact, the fact that you are here together means we should be leaning on the person on our right and leaning on the person on our left to say, guess what? It takes a village. I want you to consider who's in your world that's helping your children become the people that God has called them to be. You have some of the greatest children's pastors and youth pastors that literally all week long are putting together programs to partner with you to say, hey, we want to see your kids become who God has called them to be. I love what it says in Proverbs eleven fourteen. It says, where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in an abundance of counselors, there is victory. Like you might be here today and you just go, Ryan, I'm a single mom. I just don't have a lot of help. You might be one of those people that has seven kids. God bless you. You need multiple, 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 multiple counselors. You need multiple voices of faith in their life to help them become who God has called them to be. And sometimes what happens is we let our children's decisions become our decisions and we feel the full weight of it. Now, if you're like me, I take credit for the good and place blame for all the bad. Every single time my kids say, please, thank you, pray, read their Bibles, clean up after themselves, I say, well, look at these children. <laughs> ah, must be nice to have a father in your life imparting biblical wisdom. <laughs> Look at these values these kids have. Every time they cuss, throw something at somebody, I think they mama out here acting a fool. I don't know how. <laughs> how I don't know where they got that. I mean, the reality is my kids wouldn't be alive <laughs> if it wasn't for my wife. But there can be this tension that we have of every single time they do something it, like it's a reflection on us. But it takes a village one of the most powerful things that you can do is get your kids in the right environment for them to have a shot to be able to hear from God. And so when we invite you to events, when we put on events, we're not just trying to twist your arm and just get butts in the seat. It matters. There is something powerful about being in the room where it happened. There's something about partnering with the local church to say, hey, we're in this thing together. You go, man, I don't even have any kids. I encourage you to serve. You want to know why? Because there could be a student showing up here that needs your voice of faith. And who knows if you, if, if you could be the difference maker. Did you know that every child and every person under the sound of my voice is one voice of faith, of confidence away from being who God has called them to be? One person that could just look them in the eyes and go, you can make it. I believe in you. You have a future. There is something powerful about that when that happens in the room where it happens. I love Hebrews 10 verse 24. It says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I believe that some people can get in the habit of going, uh, I mean, I, I'll go to church kind of whenever it fits my schedule. And there is no priority of the house of faith in a family 
schedule. And there is a growing busyness with our children's schedule. And now we feel like they got to be in three sports because they're preparing for the Olympics. And then they got to learn instruments because, okay, I heard that people that have kids that, that play piano uh, somehow have a statistical anomaly of being more successful. I don't know if that's true. And so, okay, so now they got to do music. Okay, now they got to go to the pool party and the birthday party. Now we got to go to Walmart to get a gift for this person that I don't even know. And now I got to sit there for three hours and watch them run around and it's 115,000 degrees outside. Therefore, before we know it, their schedule has now become our schedule. If we're not intentional, we run the risk of becoming child-centered parents instead of God-centered parents. Are you a God-centered person or are you a sports-centered person? Are you a social media-centered person? Are you a Netflix-centered person? Are you a career-centered person? person, young person, if your parents are consistently asking you to come to church, they are not against you. They are for you. They're trying to give you a brand new center. What does that mean? If you have the wrong center, you will forget that you're not playing a sport. You are playing a game. And it's just a game. And some people that think that that is all that there is to life find out very quickly it's not because they never had a center. Some people that put all of their eggs in the basket of their career, one day they get fired. And it shakes them at their core because they didn't have a center. Hey, here's the deal. I, my kids know, hey, we will leverage whatever resources we need to to let you do the things that you feel like you want to do. Up to a point. But just so you know, it's our calendar. We'll put you on it. Like, here, here's your little game schedule. That's cool. You will make most of these games <laughs> pending our approval and how we feel that week, okay? I skipped one of my son's games to take my wife out on a date. Like, you ain't going to the game? Nah. <laughs> Have fun on your date, Dad. I will, Jackson, okay? It doesn't mean I love you any less, but I have a center. And some of us, we just, we can't miss anything. I can't miss a practice. I can't miss, I can't miss a, a recital because if I do, I'm a bad parent, according to. Question, who's passing out the parent grades these days? I'm just curious. Is it the principal? Some of us act like the middle school principal is just following us around with our kids. And I love our schools, but they, sometimes they want us to do too much. I drop you off at 7.30. Why I got to be back at 8.30 for donuts with dad? Then I got to be back at 10.30 for a fun run. Do you know how hot it is outside? This is not fun for me. So why am I doing your job? That's what I'm trying to figure out. They might as well be homeschooled. I'm here all day long, okay? I have a schedule. I have a life. You, eat, you can eat the donuts with them. I'll pick, I got to pick them up at 2.30 anyways because the line's so long. I got to be here at 1 o'clock just to pick up my son. When am I going to get some work done if I got to be up here doing P.E. for you? <laughs> Whose schedule is it? I told my son this week, I said, we're going to church. Oh, now I don't want to go to church. I said, why don't you want to go to church? He goes, I went to one community one time. I said, what happened, man? So they ain't have enough snacks for me. <laughs> you gonna come at the church of snacks? That's how we decide if we're gonna go. Get your butt in this car. We're going to church. <laughs> they had a whole tray for him. He said, I love this church, Dad. This is the best place ever. I go, come on, man, your faith can't be leaning on snacks. <laughs> but we have priorities in our home. And God comes first. Period. I know we can feel pressure, especially as men, to provide financially for our kids. Put a roof over your head, put some, put some food on the table. But if you continue to give them what they need financially, but they become malnourished spiritually, we have failed them. We didn't give them what they actually need. What I've learned is that most of what we provide financially is centered around their wants. 
but what we provide spiritually is centered around their actual needs. Reflection question for all of us. How can I put God first in our schedule? I want you to look at your calendar this week and just go, where is God in all of this running around? And sometimes what you need to do is you need to just pull over and say, can we just give some space for God? Is this what God wants us to do? Sometimes we need to take a season off and just take a break. And how do we know when? We put God first and we just try and listen to God. I say, Lord, would you convict us to go to the left or to the right? Before I had children, I used to think it was all about parents should get their kids to obey them. What I'm learning is parents should inspire their children to obey God. I'm trying to get you to obey God because what can happen as, as your kids get older is you develop a bunch of commandments. Before you know it, your house is like Leviticus and there's 613 commandments that they have to follow. And these are, the, these are the shows they can watch and they can't watch. Don't draw on this wall, but this wall you can draw on. Okay, like there's just all of these rules. I grew up uh, in a household where uh, all my mom's friends had plastic on their furniture. I'm like, can I sit here? Can I not? If you do and you're a little bit of sweaty, you're going to stick there and you're going to be able to get up. So it's just like, I don't know all of these rules in these houses. And sometimes we can get so frustrated that our kids aren't following our rules. And what we don't realize is we are technically imposing our will on their life. But can I challenge us to say, what would it look like for us to say, what if we impose God's will on their life? Hey, I'm not trying to get you to do things my way. I'm trying to get you to do things God's way. This, this is, this is uh, we're trying to inspire our children. When people are watching the movie of your life, are they inspired? Is it rules-based? Is it religion-based? Or do they see some fruit in your life that they go, I want to be like that. Man, I want to anchor for my soul. I, man, I, I realize there's so much chaos, so much craziness going on in our world, but there are some people that are just anchored. They're like a rock. And you want to know what those kinds of people do? They stay in God's word a lot. So they know how the movie ends. So they don't trip out in the middle of the movie. And so I wonder if we could be the kinds of adults that are the adults in the room that they say, you know what? We're going to have worship music playing in our house. Why? Because I, I want us to be able to have a center to come back to. I want to inspire my kids. One of my favorite things about life right now is that I get to bring my sons with me to business meetings. I get to show them what it looks like. Why? Because I believe the greatest gift we can give the next generation is helping them discover what God has called them to do. It's the greatest gift because there are people in their 60s that still haven't figured it out. And imagine if they had it 45 years earlier. Because what I can tell you, when you know what God has called you to do, you are not tripping out about how, what other people call you to do. So uh, I knew that God called me to do business and ministry, and people keep telling me I can't do both. And I just say, well, you didn't call me, so I'm going to do what God has called me to do. I'm going to do the best of my ability to offer a service that adds value to a business. And then on weekends, I am going to teach God's word to the best of my ability. And I don't have to knock on doors. I will allow God to do that because I trust him with my life. And I know what he has called me to do. So I can walk in confidence in not my gift. I can walk in confidence in my calling because I know who called me in the first place. And I refuse to give any kind of intimidation or opinion to people that didn't give me my calling in the first place. One of the greatest things that we can do for a child is to help them discover what God has called them to do, to try some things. This is why I encourage people to serve at church. Why? Because it gives you an opportunity to try some things to go, Lord, what is it that you've gifted me to do on this planet? The first thing I ever did in church was I, I served in, our, in, the, in the audio ministry. I was doing audio. It was the worst audio we ever had at that church that day. You couldn't hear nobody. It was terrible. I said, we got to move on. Okay, we got to move on to something else. <laughs> Eventually, somebody put a mic in my hand. And I said, you know what? I think, Lord, this is, this is a gift I would love to steward if you would allow me. And I discovered what God called me to do. 
I love what happened in John chapter 1, verse 40. When Andrew introduced his brother to Jesus, Simon Peter. When that meeting took place, here's what happened. It says, verse 42, Andrew took Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw Simon, he said, you are Simon, the son of John. Your name will be Cephas. The name Cephas means Peter or a rock. In this moment, what we have is Jesus going, I know you think you are who you are, but let me show you who you can be and who you will be in the future. This is a preface before Jesus goes, you are going to be the rock on which I will build my church. Peter, I got plans for you that you can't see right now. This is the kind of people I think we should be for our kids. Not to deal with them as they are, but to deal with them as they could be and to speak life over them and to speak into their future and go, I can see what's happening right now, but I'm going to get a little bit of insight from the Holy Spirit to say, this is what I know you can be. And so I'm going to be the kind of person that is a voice of faith in my child's life. I love what Proverbs 22 verse 6 says, says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. The Hebrew word for train is chanic, which means palate of mouth. In the Old Testament, Hebrew midwives would take a finger and dip it into paste and put, put on palate of a baby's mouth to initiate hunger so that they would nurse. It was a way of inspiring a child to say, oh, this is what I want to eat. Are we inspiring our children or trying to twist their arms? I think we should be the kinds of people that truly submit our plans for our children for God's plans for our children. Uh, God has a plan for each and every child and each and every person that may not be your plan. Let me tell you my plan for my kid's life. To be in the NBA without question. It's simple. Get in the NBA. That's my plan for your life. It's very, very simple. However, if it's not God's plan, Hey, boys, I'm here to support God's plan for your life. I'm on the journey with you. I ain't going nowhere. And and if I need to stop doing something to be able to show up for you so that you can be in a position to hear God and follow God's plan for your life, all of this other stuff is just stuff to me. Because there's nothing that matters more to me than seeing my children simply live in the center of God's will for their life. Reflection question. How much of my parenting is centered around my will versus God's will? How much of my parenting is centered around my will versus God's will? Lastly, before I had children, I thought parents should get their kids to take their advice. Here's what I'm learning. Parents should model their own advice. It's just, it's, it's just what I'm learning because sometimes I think my advice is fire. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, oh, I'm a guru. Come on, man, listen to me. Like, get it together. And, and then my kids get to that age where they simply do the opposite of whatever I tell them to do, you know? And so now I do reverse psychology parenting. Don't go to bed. I'm going to sleep. <sighs> it's, like, it, they, they're going to literally do the opposite of whatever I tell them to do. Okay, you need to go smoke some more weed today. I'm never picking up drugs. Oh, shucks. You know, it's like, like there's, there, like sometimes you got to trick your kids into it because we just think the way to fix our children is to just preach harder. Twist their arm a little bit more. But the most inspiring action we can do is living it. You might not be on speaking terms with your kids right now. And you think, if we could just have a conversation, I could just convince them. I could just talk them into it. And I could just change their mind. But all of the advice you've given and all of the scriptures you can think of will be so much better received if modeled and walked out and and see how you love. I, I have to honor my mom because... I've watched her ask for forgiveness from people that owed her an apology. My mom has never sat across the table from me and said, Ryan, if if you want to be a man of God, 
Be willing to apologize to people that owe you one. It's great advice. But she never told me. I watched it. Some things are taught. Some things are caught. And so you have to ask yourself, what is it that my kids are catching? What does your marriage look like? How do you treat men? How do you treat women? How do you treat people? How do you do friendships? What are your conversations full of? How do you talk on the phone? All of these things, our children are watching us. And I, I wish that all the things I've told my children, I'm like, I wish they would do that stuff. And then I see them acting like me. I go, where do you get that from? And then it's like, it's one of those things where I think you and I have to really step back and just go, man, what did we see modeled? And it may not have been good. But what are they seeing modeled? And I just, I know some of us just didn't have that model. We, whether we, some of us had a good dad, bad dad, no dad decent dad but wasn't intentional or spiritual no parents raised by grandparents we've all got different situations that you can wake up on a Sunday morning and feel like I just don't know how to do this and I think about Moses anytime I get to a place where I go I have no earthly idea what I'm doing because Moses in Exodus 4 verse 10 says uh, pardon your, your servant Lord uh, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. In case you didn't know, I am slow of speech and tongue. Realize the assignment is to lead about three million people through a desert without technology and go up against the most vitriolic leader in human history. So it'd be helpful if you could talk well. Like that's kind of that's, that's on the job description. Here is Moses going, hey God, I understand what you want me to do. However, I got some issues. And here's how the Lord responded. The Lord said to him, uh, thanks for your input on my plan for your life. Um, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. But Moses said, y'all, I, I got to be honest, Exodus 4, verse 13 might be my favorite verse in all of the Bible. Because Moses, boy, he kept, he kept it 100, okay? <laughs> Moses embodies how most of us feel on most days. My man said, pardon your servant. Excuse me. Lord, uh, please send someone else. Lord, I don't even want to do it. Okay, listen, I gave you my excuses. I didn't give you my flaws. I didn't give you my weaknesses. How about this? I quit, okay? Listen, get somebody else. Like, I don't know if you've ever woken up and just thought, maybe somebody else is coming to help these children. <laughs> they got you. And thank God they do. And, and, and in verse 14, it says, then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. I don't know where you are with the Lord today, but this is where you don't want to be. And it says, and he said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put your words in his mouth, and I will help you both to speak, and I will teach you what to do. In case you hadn't seen a great model, might I offer a heavenly, perfect father who is willing to hold your hand and show you what to do. One of the best things that you and I can do is wake up and just like this. Lord, I think I'm smart. I think I figured some things out. No. Lord, help. Maybe your kids have walked away from the Lord. And you've got chapter and verse on what you. How's that working out for you? How about you just go. Lord, would you. Would you help them see my life. As a signal of what you're doing on the planet. May I love like crazy. May I forgive like crazy. May I treat people with the utmost kindness. May I, may I be a model, an ambassador of what it means 
to be a Christ follower. Yes, preach at your kids, but seldom use words. Do it in action. In, in our home, we value generosity more than anything. It's, we, we live our life by generosity goals. We don't measure success by how much we give, by how much we make. We measure it by how much we give. And so in our house, it's, it's, it's all about giving. And so up and down 121, whenever you get off on an exit, you'll often see people with signs that say, hey, you know, I'm homeless, need food, whatever. And everybody's got a different opinion on what to do in that situation. Don't give them cash. They'll just drink more. They'll go buy drugs and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, hey, I don't answer to you. I answer to God. So I'm going to just bless people. So uh, what we decided to do was uh, we bought a bunch of gift cards, Walmart, Chipotle, Starbucks, Subway, um, and just we keep them in our middle council. Don't go looking for my car after service, okay? <laughs> Chill. Like, and so we see somebody on the side of the road, doesn't, we don't, it don't even matter what their situation is. Bam. Here you go, man. Be blessed, man. You got anything I can pray for today? Great. You know, we pray for him, and, and we, just, we just keep it moving. And now my oldest son, he wants to do it. He wants to stick it out of his child lock window. <laughs> and so, so now I'll hand it back to him, and, and, and he'll do it. And, and he feels like it's, it's like part of his life now. Like he wants to be... A giver, and now he's my little accountability partner. One time, I, I rolled up on one of them, and, and, and I was like two lanes over, and it's like, now nah, I got to get out the car, dangerous situation. Man, we bought one commitment. Man, somebody going to bless this dude. Let's just keep it moving. And so I just, I just didn't give that day. My son in the back seat said, oh, so we ain't in a giving mood today. Okay. Like, I'm like, dude, it's not religious. It's just a principle. He's like, okay, I mean, whatever you say, let them starve. I'm like, somebody is going. He, I'm sure he got 30 at least, okay? I'm like, he's been out here all day. He's like, whatever you say. Uh, one time it was raining, and I didn't want to roll my window down all the way, so I just, and I just kind of stuck the card out there. I'm like, hey, brother, come get this real fast, okay? So he came and grabbed it. I said, hey, be blessed, man. Rolled the window up and kept it moving. My son said, well, if you was really generous, you'd get him a hotel. Man, you need to calm down. You need to chill, okay? Now, my son comes to me the other day, and he's like, hey, hey, Dad, I want to be rich. I said, me too. Um, now, my son's definition of rich is two things. You either have to have A, a pool, or B, a Lamborghini. And if you don't have one of two, if not both, you ain't doing nothing in this world. You are a peasant in his mind, okay? So my son right now believes he has to make it in the NBA so that he can get a new house for his mom and move her out of the slums of McKinney. So um, I don't know what he thinks about us, but I'm like, go ahead, man, whatever. Poor us. Yeah, man, if you could just help us move on up to the east side. Um, so I said, son, why do you want to be rich? He said, so I can end homelessness. Oh, that's right. Never talked about it. He said, dad, it just bothers me that these people have to be out here. And he goes, dad, I just, I'm going to make so much money and I'm going to get a Lamborghini and I'm going to give it to them. I said, hey, wait, 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 wait. I like where your heart is. We need to talk through some practicality here. You can't, you can't do that. But in his mind, he's like, no, this is why we're here. I've never taught him this. He's caught this. And what God wants to do with that, let him do it. When I graduated high school, I went to a private school, uh, which meant that we were uh, living in a, on the in a lower income neighborhood, traveling across town to a private school that was on the east side of town. I grew up with a lot of affluent families, predominantly white families, and, and when it came to our graduation party, they said, hey, let's do a joint graduation party. I went, oh, if we do a joint graduation party, I know they party gonna be off the chain and then we ain't gotta pay for it. So I'm like, okay, great. So we went and did it at one of my friend's house huge mansion. They put four of us on stools and all of the fathers had to bestow a graduation gift to all of the boys. And I said, hey, you think we can let my dad go first? Because I don't think it's going to be at the level that everybody else's daddy is going to be doing the gifts. 
And, and y'all don't know my dad, but my dad had me when he was 50. So by the time I graduated, he was 68. And at 68, you don't care about nothing, nobody, what anybody thinks about you. EQ, what's that? You don't care, all right? So I was like, hey, if we just let my dad go first, like, no, he's a reverend. We want to honor your father and let him go last. I said, no, nah, I don't think that's a good idea. But so we get all these awesome gifts, and, and all of a sudden, it's my dad's turn. And he says, uh, I ain't got no gift. <laughs> but I do have a song. I said, Jesus, come back right now. I need the trumpets to sound right now. Now, we all know, like, when it comes to worship music, there's black music, there's white music. And then there's middle of the road, like everybody in general, how great thou art, you know. My dad wasn't doing no how great thou art. I'll tell you that right now. I was like, oh my gosh, Lord, please just let him give something, that's a song that someone here actually knows. I don't want to be here. I want to go back to middle school. This is terrible. And my dad started singing. Anointing. Fall on me, anointing, fall on me. Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall on me, anointing, fall on me. Now, this is how he actually sounded. Anointing, fall on me. Jesus, you did not come back soon enough. What is going on? I mean, my white friends are like, what in the world is this? I've never heard this song before. I'm like, I know. I mean, it, I just, and I was so mad. I mean, my mom could have tell I came home, I was snapping. How you going to embarrass me in front of my friends? And I'm just losing it. I'm like, what was that? And, and about, I think it was about, Four or five years later, I was preaching, and somebody came up to me afterwards, and they said, that was anointed, and something broke in my life, because that's what anointing does. It breaks yoke. And I'll never forget calling my father and apologizing. I said, Dad, I'm sorry for being so mad because I wanted you to give me something that I thought I wanted. But you gave me exactly what I needed. May you and I be the kinds of parents, the kind of mentors that gives the next generation what they need. Faith to move mountains. Come on, can we pray for healing to be in their hands? Can we pray for prophetic words to be on their lips? Can we give them what actually matters? May, we not, may it not take decades for us to look back and go, what have we been doing? We got all our priorities wrong. We just been trying to prove what? To provide what and we didn't give them what they actually needed and I know sometimes our kids just roll their eyes or that's just spiritual but I promise you a day will come where they will need that faith a hospital room will need their faith a boardroom will need their faith a locker room will need their faith and one day they'll call and say thank you for making me sit on the front row. Thank you for making me go to that conference. Thank you for putting me in the room where it happens. 
Thank you for letting me be in a sport, but not making the sport my center. Thank you. How's your household? I got a feeling that this weekend we got a little bit of work to do. Some priorities, perhaps, to rearrange. To say, Lord, I, <laughs> I don't know what's going to mark your parenting. But I hope it's not, well, look at me. I I paid for their college. Who cares if they lose their faith in college? Look, I got them a car. Look. And they'll need another one in 10 years anyways. And so sometimes when when I talk about countercultural parenting, we got a bunch of lists of expectations that I think sometimes are going in the wrong direction my prayer for us this weekend is that God would help us align our homes in a way that honors Him. And that push come to shove. We would remember that God has placed us in their life for a reason. It could be somebody at your job. It could be somebody in a classroom. A young lady came to me last week. She said, Ryan, I I struggle with classroom anxiety. I don't want to go to school. I, then I thought, I wonder how many teachers struggle with classroom anxiety. I wonder how many principals struggle with school anxiety. And then I think, thank God for one community. Thank God they got you. Thank God they got a voice of faith that will meet them where they're at. Thank God that they have a God that will meet them in their classroom and meet them in their hall and meet them in their locker room because that's what our God can do. Imagine if you and I were those people that says, you know what, I'm not just here. I'm here for a reason. And the Holy Spirit can get a hold of me anytime he wants and to speak life into a young person and say, son, I know I'm just your coach, but I'm not just your coach. I see God's hand on your life. And there's more to life than this ball. There's more to life than money. There's more to life than just this degree. There's more to life. Wherever you are, know this. God has given you influence in somebody's life. You should leverage it to honor God in everything that you do. Stand to your feet. I want to pray a special blessing over you today. I believe that parenting be hard. But I believe if God can meet a man that was 85 years old in a desert and teach him what to do, that would be Moses. Then he can meet us in our living rooms, in our kitchen tables, in our apartments, in our houses, at our jobs, with the right words to say to help the next generation. Father, I thank you so much for One Community Church. God, I pray that you would help us be the parents, the mentors, the aunts, the uncles, the the nannies, the babysitters, the parents, the the step-parents that you called us to be, the in-laws you've called us to be. Would you give us the wisdom that we need to help the next generation? God, I pray that you would be the center of our homes, that nothing else would be our center. May you be the thing we always come back to. May you be our home plate. May nothing take your place in our homes. We honor you today. God, I pray for each and every child that has walked away from their faith. God, I call them home right now in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that there will be divine appointments for each and every child that's represented here today. I pray, God that our lives would embody your message. I pray, God, that the way that we live would be the greatest message that we could send to the next generation. And I pray, God, that our children and our grandchildren and their children would be people of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say it. Amen.